Hi there, and welcome to day two of the Praying Christian Women online conference. I'm Jamie with Praying Christian Women, and I could not be more excited to have you here right smack in the middle of a conference on day two. We had a great day yesterday talking about personal growth, and we were just equipped with some great lessons and tips and things that we can incorporate into our prayer lives to really grow personally, grow in our prayer lives and kind of launch you forward into the next level of your prayer life. I loved every single one of them. Today, our theme is unleashing your inner warrior. Some of these might be a little bit heavy and we're talking about spiritual warfare. And so because of that, and because of the nature of this topic that we're going to cover today, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about the most important component of prayer. And you might be surprised to find out that the most important component of prayer is not a what, but a who. And the who, as you may or may not guess, is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is everything in our prayer lives. He is our connection to God. He is God living in us. So I want to be clear. If you don't know Jesus. If you're not a Christian, God hears you. He created you. You're a child of God, whether you believe in God or not, whether you've trusted in Jesus or not, you were created by God and God is omniscient. We hear that word a lot. He's all knowing. So he knows everything. He knows the innermost desires of our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows what we're going to do next. And so, yes, he does hear your prayers. If you're not a Christian. That's my belief. He, he hears and knows everything. There's no way around that, but there is something missing. If you're not a Christian, if you have not placed your faith in Jesus, there is something missing because what we know from Ephesians, and I'm going to read this Bible verse for you. This is Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. What we know is that when we place our faith in Jesus, a transaction takes place. We are actually filled with the Holy Spirit when we believe in Jesus. So this says Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So Jesus promised his disciples that they would receive the Holy Spirit after he left because when he was with them, they had God, the son with them. But when he left, they were going to need someone to teach them and to continue to equip them as the early church to remember the things that Jesus had told them to be taught, to be comforted, to be in, empowered, to be emboldened. And those are all things the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit also intercedes. That's another job that he has. And so the Bible says that the Holy Spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words. When we don't know what to pray, when we don't have the words, he intercedes for us. I believe, and this isn't, this is extrapolating. This is, this is according to me, not the Bible. I believe that the Holy Spirit also kind of translates our prayers to God and helps us to pray in accordance with God's will. So when we go to God in prayer, the Holy Spirit can actually teach us that is biblical. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He can teach us what God's heart longs for. He can mold our prayers. We can go into prayer and begin praying in one direction. And the Holy Spirit can actually transform our prayers as we're praying and open to the work of the Holy Spirit so that our prayers aren't just a laundry list of things that we want. They are in accordance with God's will. They can be, they aren't always, no one has a hundred percent track record, but the Holy Spirit is a huge part of being able to connect with God and wage war against the enemy in this spiritual battle that we know exists. So what I want to talk to you about is that the Holy Spirit, um, it, I, the Holy Spirit has, has several different jobs. I'm going to name, name some of those off. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible. We've said our teacher, our comforter, the one who intercedes when we don't have words to pray. Um, it is the Holy Spirit that connects us to God directly, who lives in us 
and produces fruit. The fruit of the spirit, according to the Bible, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It doesn't mean that someone without the Holy Spirit can't exhibit some of these things at some time, but the Holy Spirit is the person who helps to uh, carry on to completion that work that Christ began in us when we first became believers. The, the Holy Spirit is the one that produces supernatural fruit that we couldn't conjure up on our own, no matter how hard we tried and helps us to become more like Jesus as we walk with him and learn from him. Um, so my question to you right now, what I really want to talk to you about is, have you placed your faith in Jesus? Have you received the Holy Spirit in you? Has that transaction taken place? And it might seem like kind of a weird question at first, because you might be thinking, well, I came to a prayer conference. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But maybe when I ask it specifically, not just are you a Christian or, or do you believe that the Bible is, is God's word? Um, if I ask you, have you placed your faith in Jesus? That might make you think, well, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I have, but I don't really remember. Today is the day that you can know. And we really wanted to make sure that we provided you with an opportunity to hear the gospel clearly. And if you've never heard it before, I mean, you might have been going to church your whole life, and it's possible never to have actually heard or understood what the gospel says. And I know that sounds strange, but it is possible because it's it's not always presented clearly, whether it's in our churches or if, if you are not a churchgoer, but you read the Bible you still may have, may have missed it. Maybe you have not seen it there and that's okay. That is something that's very common. And it's something that Alana and I wanted to really make sure that we presented during this conference so that you could know. Um, another situation could be that uh, maybe you have made a commitment, maybe a long time ago, maybe as a child. Um, and then you kind of fell away from your faith and you're not really sure if you were saved in the first place. And we're not here. We can't know. No one can know that. But what it can do is give you an opportunity to be sure that God knows and that you know that you believe and that you place your faith in Jesus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of go through the gospel, present the gospel to you in um, actually from this really neat website that lays it out very clearly. I'm going to use some scripture that I put in there, but, um, but this website is called life in six words.com. I want you to check it out because it's very cool. They have some really neat resources there and it's the gospel message explained and it's G O S P E L. And it goes through each of these words, um, each of these letters, the beginning of each letter of the word gospel to kind of lay out the gospel and what it means. So I'm going to read this for you. I'm going to add some scriptures because I believe that when you hear scripture, the Holy Spirit can speak to you. And that is when you can hear and respond and your spirit will respond to that truth in belief. And if that happens for you, if you hear this gospel message and you believe and you don't know if you've ever actually committed your life to Christ. It's the belief that saves you. The Bible says that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the belief is what saves you, but the prayer to, I'm going to lead you in a prayer afterwards. And that prayer is a way for you to put into words that belief, to commit to God, that belief, and to have a way to look back and say, you know what? On April 13th, 2021, I committed my life to Jesus. It's for you and, and it's for you to know for sure. So I just want to go through this for you because I believe that there's someone, someone's many, someone's maybe who need to hear this and, and this, that this is for you. Maybe God drew you to this conference and you're not even a prayer. Maybe you don't even know if you believe in God and somehow God drew you to this conference. Maybe this is why. Maybe he's calling you, and I just want to give you that opportunity to respond to that call. 
So the first letter in gospel is G. God created us to be with him. This is the foundation. God is the creator. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis 1 and 2, it talks about how God creates all of the universe and everything in it. In Genesis 2, 7 through 9, God creates man and makes a home for him, a garden where God is known to walk. In Genesis 3, 8, it talks about that, um, that God actually walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Um, Genesis 2, 7 through 9, I'm going to read this. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. This shows love. God created humans because he loves us. And after he created humanity, he saw that it was good. He created pleasing to the eye trees. He didn't have to do that. He did it because they were beautiful, because he wanted to please man. He wanted us to be happy. He wanted to be in fellowship with us. And he provided food. So God created man in, to be in complete fellowship with him and with each other. But all of that changed because there was just one rule. And that rule was, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was just one tree that they couldn't eat from. There were all these other trees that they could eat from. But as humans with free will, they made a mistake. And that brings us to O in the gospel message. Our sins separate us from God. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, you know, my kids have all at some point vocalized the fact that they don't think that it's fair that Adam and Eve got to decide whether we get to uh, live in fellowship with God, that, well, they were the ones that sinned. They were the ones that brought sin into the world. That doesn't seem fair. If I had been tested, I would have done different. <laughs> and I've thought that myself too. But the Bible says in Romans 5, 12 through 14, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. Now, that might have seemed a little confusing, but basically sin entered the world through one man. And you scroll down to verse 14, that sin ruled before the law was given, even over those who didn't sin by breaking a command. So this is where this idea of sin, of original sin, of, of just the sinful nature of man came to be is through scriptures like this, where it talks about we, even if we never actually sinned, we have a sinful nature and God being holy doesn't, he's not just mean by saying that we can't be in fellowship with him and that our sin separates us from him. God physically cannot be in the presence of anything that's not holy and pure. He's that pure and holy that Anything that's not pure just is destroyed in his presence. The Bible says that, that we would fall dead if we were in his presence because of his glory and his holiness. So if all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, even if we've never, even if we were to say, oh, well, I've never sinned, which none of us can say that. But even if we could, we have this sinful nature that keeps us from God. It's we're born with it and it's something that separates us from God. And there, there has to be a solution. We can't overcome it through anything that we can do on our own. That gives, that brings us into the S, which is the S in gospel, which is sins can't be removed by good deeds. So God created us because he loves us. He designed us to be in fellowship with him. Sin came into the world and we became separated from him. Well, now how do we get back to him? Right? Well, sin cannot be removed by good deeds. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. 
This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So can we do good works? Absolutely. We were created to do good works, but can those good works get us to heaven? Can they bridge that gap between us and God and make us holy? No, there are no number of good works that we could do to earn our way to heaven. So if you're thinking, well, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be with God forever because I'm a good person. That is not biblical. What's biblical is all have sinned and we need a rescue plan and we can't muster up enough goodness in ourselves to make it happen. So it's a problem. It's a big problem. That brings us to the P in gospel, paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. So when Jesus came to earth, he came as a fulfillment of the law. So I'm not going to get too deeply involved in this, but God did provide a temporary plan for the people of Israel. You notice in that verse back when I was, to, when, when I was reading from um, Romans, where it says sin was in the world before the law was given and sit, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. So what happened at the time of Moses? Well, the 10 commandments were given, the law was given and God gave them a system for a temporary system of the law that allowed them to sacrifice animals. And the blood of these animals was used in atonement for their sins or to pay the price for their sins so that they could be made right with God. So each year and at other times during the year, they would make these sacrifices and they had to sacrifice perfect animals. They couldn't be blemished in any way. They couldn't be lame or gashed or um, deformed. They had to be perfect animals and they would make these sacrifices or the priests would make these sacrifices to make them right with God. And so while, while um, that system was in place for a temporary time, those sacrifices had to be made again and again and again and again and again and again. And it was bloody. It was a physical, visible reminder of their imperfections. And the Bible actually says that the law itself was given not to save people. It was given to point to the fact that we can't be perfect. It was given so that it could highlight the fact if there were no laws given, then no one would really know that, that there was any law to break. Right. But God gave these laws to show us this sinful nature that we have this inability to be perfect, this inability to live up to his standards of holiness. So Hebrews 10, one through four explains this a little bit. It says the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? So this law, these sacrifices can't make you perfect. They can be a temporary fix, a temporary atonement but they'll never make you righteous in God's eyes. You'll always have to keep sacrificing. So it goes on to say, for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So they can pay for the sins, but they can't take them away once for all. And what we know is that Jesus, who is a reflection of that law, he is the fulfillment of that law. Jesus himself was born as a baby. He lived a perfect life. He was that unblemished sacrifice because he was perfect, because he was fully God and fully man. And he died on the cross, shed his blood, just like the blood of those animals was shed to temporarily pay the price for those sins? Well, because he was perfect and because he was a human and because he was God and an infinite being, 
he was able to pay an infinite price so that one time his death once paid the price for our sins, the sins of the whole entire world, for any sins that you have committed in the past, in the present, and at any time in the future, that one sacrifice was enough for all of humanity. That's how powerful that sacrifice was. And that was our rescue plan. That is what God did to bridge the gap between himself and his holiness and us. Because the Bible says when God looks upon us, when we placed our faith in Jesus, he sees Jesus. He's a substitution. He sees the holiness of Jesus and we can be in his presence, even though we are sinful. The Bible said that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that when we place our faith in him, we can take on that perfection. We can be seen by God as perfect. I'm going to read a couple of verses. So uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. This was foretold. So the Bible separated into the Old Testament and the New Testament hundreds of years before Jesus was born, it was prophesied that a redeemer would come, that a savior would come, that he would die, that he would be a, a lamb, that he would be slaughtered, that his blood would pay the penalty for our sins. And this is beautifully displayed in the Passover Seder. So if you've never participated in a Passover Seder, it's a Jewish tradition, but Christians have adopted this and Messianic Jews have also um, done this where the Passover Seder, the meal that Jesus and his disciples partook on, on Maundy Thursday or in the, in the upper room at the last supper, this meal is just like this incredible foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. And that's why this Passover celebration is so intimately linked with Jesus's death and resurrection. It happened at the same time, not by accident. God always has a plan. And it was the fulfillment of this Passover imagery of when the angel of death passed over the people of Israel and spared their children because the blood of the, the perfect animal was um, spread across their doorposts. It was, it was a foreshadowing. It was a symbol of what Jesus would do. So we are spared God's wrath. We are spared the penalty and the punishment for our sins. So it's a beautiful picture. So Jesus rose from the dead. This is important. Did those animals of those sacrifices ever raise themselves from the dead? They were not raised from the dead, but Jesus on the third day after his death, after he took on the penalty of our sins and paid for them with his blood and his death, those sins died with Jesus. And when he rose from the dead, he rose to eternal life. And just like him, we are raised and new. When you hear the term born again, that is what it means. It means that just like Jesus was resurrected from death to life, that's what happens to our spirits when we put our faith in Jesus. Our spirits that are dead in sin are resurrected from death to life. And the Holy Spirit indwells us and empowers us. And that's very different from the old system of sacrifice. And it also points to our eternal souls existing with God in heaven for eternity. So that kind of brings us to the E. We sort of got a sneak peek of that. We got, I got ahead of myself, but the E in gospel is everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. John 3, 16 and 17. You might know this. You might want to say it along with me for God. So loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. How many times have you heard that the gospel is exclusive or that Jesus or Christianity are somehow uh, 
condemning the world. I've heard that a lot. And the truth is that he did not come into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come to say, oh, you know, you get to come to heaven and you don't. You get to have eternal life and you don't. He came to earth to say, come, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You are striving so hard to try and be good. You're striving so hard to work your way to heaven, to work your way to God, and it's fruitless. Come to me, trust in me, and I will give you rest because all you have to do is be yoked with me. All you have to do is follow me. And not only are you clean the moment you believe in me, but you are unshackled from the heavy burden of striving to do the right thing all the time. Because Hebrews, this is, this is the core of, the, of, of what the Christian life is about. Okay, it's this. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you would not grow weary and lose heart. When you come to Jesus, you are able to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles because your eyes aren't fixed on a, a don't do list. Your eyes aren't fixed on don't do this and don't do this. Don't swear. Don't yell. Go to church. Look this way. Do this. That's out the window, guys. When we become believers, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Just look at him. Look at his example. Strive to be more like him. Don't strive to stop doing the bad stuff that you know is wrong. Just try to be more like Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He is the author, the perfecter of your faith. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And there is joy and freedom. And, and you will be unshackled from the burden of striving. The Bible says, cease striving and know that I am God. Jesus wants us to follow him and to be yoked with him so that he can teach us and help us to live life to the full. And that brings us to the last letter of the gospel, which is L. Life with Jesus starts now and it lasts forever. I love that this website includes the L which is that life begins now. Eternal life, or another translation of eternal life, is life to the full. It begins now. It's not a, you know, salvation isn't a get out of hell free card. It's not a ticket to heaven. It's uh, another translation of that, that eternal life is this life to the full, which means that we get to live full joyful lives now and when our bodies pass away will exist forever in fellowship with God. So we get fellowship with God now in form of that deposit, that Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit indwelling us. And we also have the hope of heaven when this world passes away and when we pass away. Um, so I'm so glad they included that because sometimes we look at only Okay, let, let's check off the list. Yes, I, I prayed the prayer. I'm, I'm in heaven now. You know, I'm going to go to heaven. So now I'm just going to live like life as normal. There's so much more for us than just get out of hell free. <laughs> God has plans for us. He wants us to partner with him in fighting spiritual battles, in waging war against the enemy, in partnering with him to see his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That's part of our mission. And it's a mission that is full of joy and excitement and purpose. And we would miss that if we forgot that becoming a believer begins the moment you become a believer. Becoming, uh, coming into eternal life begins 
the moment you trust in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. So again, this website is lifeinsixwords.com, the gospel message explained. So this is really um, a great resource. I love it. So if you have heard these verses, if you've heard the gospel, maybe you've heard it for the hundredth time, but somehow it's, it's different today and it resonates with you and God spoke to you and is calling you to commit your life to him, or maybe he's calling you to rededicate your life to him. If you've been away from him for a while, do it. I'm going to lead you through a prayer right now. And I want you to just give your life to him and surrender through this. Father, I know you love me, that you created me with a desire to have fellowship with me from now through all eternity. I know I'm not perfect and that there's nothing I could ever do to earn eternal life. I realize that you are so perfect, so holy, that you can't tolerate being in the presence of sin. And because of that, I will have to spend eternity apart from you unless something is done. I believe that the answer to this problem is Jesus. I believe that Jesus was born as a baby on earth, that he lived a perfect life, and as the perfect lamb, fulfilling the law, fulfilling the prophecies, he was sacrificed by dying on a cross. Just as the people of Israel made sacrifices over and over to atone for their sins, Jesus died one time for all as a perfect sacrifice to pay for all of my sins, any sins in my past, any sins in my present, and any sins in my future. I believe this, and by placing my faith in Jesus as my rescuer, my Lord, and my Savior, I accept this gift of salvation. I accept the gift of the Holy Spirit who will dwell in me, teach me, help me, and comfort me, and will produce the fruit of the Spirit to help me become more like Jesus. I accept the gift of life to the full here on earth and eternal life in heaven when my earthly body passes away or when Christ returns. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, if you committed your life to Christ, then welcome to God's family. And we want to hear from you. We really want to know if you made that commitment so that we can celebrate with you, so that we can pray for you, um, include prayer requests. And I just want to say, if you're still hesitant if you feel like for some reason your past is too sketchy or you have sinned too much for God to want you or love you, I need you to, to take that thought and just uh, throw it back into the pit where it belongs because that is not true. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died to pay the price once for all to remove guilt. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So you may stand proudly knowing that you are forgiven, that your sins have been removed from you as far as the East is from the West. That is in the Bible. That is biblical. So if you've prayed this prayer, if you've believed for the first time or maybe rededicated your life to, to Christ after a time of being away from the Lord, we want to hear about that. We want to hear your story. And we want to celebrate with you. So email us at connect at prayingchristianwomen.com. And one more thing. I had to grab my book. So Alana has created this really awesome resource called 30 Days of Prayer for the Unsaved. So it is, if you want to get it for free, it's 30 Days of Prayer, not just a clever name. And if you know someone that might want to hear this message and you want to share it with them, please do. This is going to be a little different from our other sessions in that this is going to be shareable. I'm going to make sure you have these links um, that you can share with others that you think might want to hear. Maybe someone that's been asking questions about your faith and wants to hear the gospel and hear what it's all about. Um, but if you have people in your life that you're praying for to come to know the Lord, um, we have this great resource and it's called 30 days of prayer for the unsaved. It's um, 30 prayers and verses that you can get um, by email. And so you go to prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved, and you will get this resource for free. 
if you would like a hard copy, you can also go on Amazon and you can get this beautiful book, 30 Days of Prayer for the Unsaved by Alana. And it's in large print, which I love that about this book. So it's very easy to read. And I like having it in my hand. Um, each of these prayers um, has blank spaces. So you can see these blank spaces where you can uh, write the name or insert the name as you pray of the person or people that you're praying for. And it's just a great way to thoroughly pray for the, the friends and family members that you want to come to the Lord. And um, it has uh, just all different facets of prayer for the people that God has placed on your heart to pray for salvation. So again, you can get that for free, not the book, but you can get a digital resource at prayingchristianwomen.com slash unsaved, or go to Amazon. If you want the hard copy of the book for a price, I'm not sure how much it is. Um, and email us with those stories too. If you've been praying for someone and you've seen God moving, let us know. We would love to know that. Or if you have prayer requests for people, we would love to be praying for you and add you to our prayer list. So you can email us at connect at prayingchristianwomen.com. That is all I have for you. I am so excited about this day of prayer, um, uh, this day of, uh, of our prayer conference. There are going to be just some incredible speakers and I know that, that this is going to be just a, a really awesome day. So buckle up and join us for the next sessions of the Praying Christian Women Online Conference. And we look forward to seeing you again soon.